my name is Jackie Adams, and as I was introduced, I'm the Goodall Gallery Director at Columbia College, and uh, I'm also serving as the Centennial Creative Director at Columbia College. So what that means is um, my role is to really dig into this story. Now, I'm, I'm not an art historian trained <coughs> like Will is, but my job is, uh, is to kind of play art historian for at least the year, because I have to sort of dig into Georgia O'Keeffe's time here wrap my head around it and really understand what her time meant. And most importantly for the college and our students and all the different audiences that are gonna engage with this, with this really remarkable history for our, for our city. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of some of the things that I've learned. And I have a, an official art historian right next to me so he can correct me whenever sure. I'm wrong. <laughs> so if I get anything incorrect, um, you know, I do have some help here. But uh, I'm going to give you a little overview, and I'm going to, uh, and I think it's important to go back to the spring of 2015. Georgia O'Keeffe arrived here on September 22nd, 1915. So she arrived almost a month ago, literally almost a month ago, about 100 years ago. But really, sort of the seeds of what um, led to her time here were starting back in the spring of, of 1915 at the Teachers College at Columbia University. This is where she was uh, taking some classes and she was 27 at the time. She was in the teacher's college taking drawing, and uh, she met up with uh, a young woman, a traditional college age student by the name of Anita Pollitzer. And I think Anita Pollitzer was about 20 years old, mm -hmm. maybe? Younger, yeah. A little bit younger. Georgia O'Keeffe, um, she was taking classes intermittently, so she wasn't on this sort of straightforward track as most college students are um, when, they enter, when they enter college at the traditional age, whereas Anita Pollitzer was. And the two of them sort of made an interesting combination. Because by 27, Georgia O'Keeffe was, you know, she was a little more reserved. She had been around the block a couple of times. She had, she had been to Chicago. She had worked as an illustrator. Her family had already uh, gone through some pretty significant financial changes that was impacting her life in a great way. She had moved from Wisconsin, where she was born, to Virginia. So her life had really taken some big changes uh, Anita Pollitzer was from Charleston, South Carolina. She lived at 5 Pitt Street. And she was a vivacious young woman when she got to New York. She, she delved into everything and anything that she absolutely could. She got her hands on reading. She went to the opera. Um, she really loved living in New York City. She enjoyed it very much. The two of them showed great artistic promise and they were actually sort of separated from their group of students and they would work together with another third person by the name of Dorothy True. And these three young women um, developed a friendship. But Anita Pollitzer and Georgia O'Keeffe, that friendship is very significant to us. Because when Georgia O'Keeffe arrives here, we know much of what happened here because she wrote to Anita Pollitzer. She and her exchanged uh, a, a variety of letters and, and they are great documents for us to tell this story. So at the end of the spring semester, Anita Pollitzer and Georgia O'Keeffe uh, have to end the semester as usual and they have to go for ha to have their summer vacations. And Anita Pollitzer comes back to South Carolina and she vacations with her family in the mountains of North Carolina and she writes about this to Georgia O'Keeffe and Georgia O'Keeffe goes to the University of Virginia and she's teaching drawing classes and Really, it's important to think about that transition from the spring to the summer because it shows a big difference in their lifestyles and where these two young women came from. Anita Pollitzer was from a wealthy, prominent political family in Charleston, and Georgia O'Keeffe was independent. She was by herself. She had to look for opportunities to sustain her, her living and her well-being, so she couldn't necessarily go on vacation. But when she went to the University of Virginia, she accepted a job there to make money to earn money. So this was kind of the cycle that Georgia O'Keeffe found herself in. She was taking classes, she was picking up jobs, she needed to work. It's at the end of the summer that she begins to sort of deliberate, what am, what am I gonna do next? And you know, Georgia O'Keeffe sort of, ha you know, she, she, she doesn't have this long-term trajectory that you see in her life. She sort of decides what she's gonna do and she does it. So she hits the end of summer at the University of Virginia and, and she writes to Anita Pollitzer and she's really trying to figure out, do I go back to New York? But wait, I've got this position at Columbia College and I think, I'm, I think I might take it. And the two of them start to exchange letters at that point and it's where you can see 
O'Keefe is really starting to formulate in her mind what this move is going to mean for her, what she wants this move to be to her. And she clearly writes in her letters, I want some, I want some time away from New York. I've got these ideas sort of percolating. And Will's going to talk a little bit about where these ideas are coming from in terms of modernism. But she had ideas in her mind. And she was really hoping to get, I think, some solitude, some peace and quiet to sort of work through some of this creative potential that was stirring and, and happening in her, for her in her mind. So at the end of the summer, she decides, by, I think September 18th is when you see a letter dated to Anita, she's coming to Columbia. She said, I've made up my mind. I'm, I'm going to Columbia. And she said that, you know, it, it was a little with, with heavy heart that she, that she came here. I don't think it was something necessarily she was looking forward to, but I think she felt like this is something I need to do. So she arrives in Columbia on September 22nd, 1915. And as I was doing the research for the centennial, I really wanted to try to get a picture of what Columbia was like then and what the college was like then. And I, we have the 1916 yearbook here on display. And if you go through that yearbook, there's uh, an essay in the yearbook that talks about when the students arrived on campus that year. They don't talk about the hardships, though, in the yearbook. They talk about the, the buoyant spirit that was happening uh, and that these, uh, the young women have arrived. They've come by streetcar. They're in Columbia. They're here to start their college careers. But in reality, at the time, the college was in dire straits. World War I was happening at the time. Cotton prices had fallen drastically, so sending your daughter to school was uh, was a was a hard choice for a lot of families at that time. So the college had a capacity of bringing in 300 students, and from what I understand, we had about 150 students at the time, and we had about 10 faculty. So the college was really not in a great position to, you know, it, it was struggling. It was struggling. Another thing that had happened to the college was um, there had been a, a huge fire that took down uh, the first building that was built at the campus on North Main Street. This was a beautiful campus. We don't have pictures of it up, but it was a, just a wonderful um, piece of architecture that stood on North Main. But it burned almost completely in uh, 1909. And then they built the new building, Old Main, which survived until 1964, and then it suffered a massive fire. This building, Old Main, is where Georgia O'Keeffe uh, worked in. This is where she taught her classes. And she had a room that was right next to a family called the Ariel family. And this is another important, important connection, because the Ariel family is who she really befriended. She loved their four-year-old daughter very much. And she became good friends with uh, Doc Milton Ariel. Doc was his nickname. So they were around the same age, and Doc was an English professor. And while she was at Columbia College, she didn't befriend a lot of people. <laughs> she didn't know anyone. But it was very difficult for her to find genuine relationships. But she was keeping a conduit of communication back with Anita. And Anita was sending her. Uh, catalogs of 291 and feeding her sort of that cultural lifeline that she really missed from New York City. But Doc Milton Ariel um, was someone on campus that she formed a really great friendship with and the two of them had some really wonderful exchanges. She would show her charcoal drawings to him and uh, he would have sort of these wild reactions. You know, there's a quote in one of her letters that says, you know, you know, this stuff is as wild as a March hare. What is this? You know, he did not get it. But in those letters, he writes about her daughter, Cecilia Ariel, and uh, just the genuine sort of nature of fun and energy that comes from this young woman. There's another student, uh, and we have a picture of her in the exhibition by the name of Adelaide Horsefall. And this is another pupil. She was 11 years old, who Georgia O'Keeffe took great interest in. In fact, as she was sending her drawings back to Anita in New York City, she was also sending the works of Adelaide up to New York City. And I know Will has done some really interesting research to see if we could find Adelaide or to see if she, if there was anything available. Didn't any find evidence. anything. It wasn't that interesting. <laughs> Zero. So, 
Yeah, it's, it was, it was, you know, this has been a really interesting research process for us. So what we, part of the centennial for us was to dig into the story and to develop the centennial at Columbia College around the historical, these really very significant historical marks in the story. So for us, September 22nd is a very um, distinct date for us. That's when she arrived. Um, January 1st is another one of those dates in the centennial timeline that's very important. I'm going to let Will talk a little bit about those drawings that she created here uh, in South Carolina because it's a pretty wonderful, wonderful gift. Okay. Can you all hear me just fine? Yeah. It's a gift, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we're going to do, <laughs> unless you're my wife. Okay, so we're going to do art history 150 years in like three minutes. How many of you remember seeing the show, the Hudson River School exhibition here? Excellent. Now those paintings were about counting every leaf on the tree, were they not? Absolute certitude. Why? Because nature is creation and the facts of God dominate. Your role isn't to question nature, it is just to translate it onto canvas. And that's the ethos of the Hudson River School painters. Late 19th century, what happens to that? The Impressionists come along and say, well, you never really see every leaf. If you're standing in nature, this is the experience you have. And they start to summarize things. So Impressionism shocked people, if, if not you know, scandalized people. It was a huge kind of revolution. After Impressionism, things really get scary because Matisse puts a great big green line through the portrait of his wife. Does she really look that way? And first of all, I want to know if she was upset. I, don't, <laughs> I doubt it. But he does this he gives massive, and they call, the, they call Matisse and his followers the wild beasts. Right? So suddenly you go from, you know, truth is beauty and beauty is truth, and that's all you need to know with the Hudson River School, towards, you know, my sensations in nature are more important with the Impressionists. So you get to Matisse and Picasso, and they say, and I know some of you drink, right? Your very next cocktail party, you must repeat this. Not with a cigarette, just a, just a drink. Picasso's great contribution was that he made art self-referential. That painting doesn't refer to nature anymore or to your wife. It refers to itself as a work of art. That's huge because here's God and nature and here's the artist and here's what happens in this art history <laughs> under three minutes. It goes from here and here to here. <coughs> then the artist becomes dominant. And so in America, where truth to nature had been a very strong impulse, so strong that Impressionist painters in America really still looked like Hudson River School painters, only with bright paint. They still were very careful draftsmen. I can draw and I don't make mistakes because truth to nature is correct. And so what, are they, what do you do with Matisse and Picasso? Well, in America, not much. That's the answer, 100 years ago. There were like six people really taking them seriously. And you could name them. You know, it was Dove and Marin and it was Stieglitz. One of them was O'Keeffe. She knew the work. She knew this work through seeing it at Camera Works. She knew it from seeing it at 291 in New York. And she knew it from continued discussions with Anita Pollitzer in her letters. So when she's at Columbia, she has ideas of her own, but she also has some radical art history in her head. But the thing that really stuns me about her Keith's time in Columbia is she was not yet in the shadow of Stieglitz. She had not met him. She's not, you know, right, he's not right there being this dominant force in her life. She's not at the Art Students League anymore in the shadow of William Merritt Chase and all his paintings of dead animals. She's completely on her own and what she decides to do is start all over again. And I love the backdrop that you gave because she's in this building and she's surrounded by professors that she likes, students that she likes. She wrote all kinds of nasty things about Columbia. Make no mistake about it, when you read her letters, I said to the crowd last night, you know, where our slogan is famously hot, she says in one of her letters, Columbia, deliciously stupid. <laughs> I am making this up. I'm just repeating it. 
But the fact is, hey, look, some of us have lived in New York. You say a lot of bad things about the place you're living in, and you turn around and say really great things about it. That's the reality. And she had, she loved nature, she had friends, and she had this time that you touched on to work by herself, where people weren't telling her what to do and, and how it looked. And so she took these ideas of her own, but she married them with this backdrop of art could be self-referential. It was a huge thing that was going on in modernism, and it was happening right then. Art historians like me were not sitting around saying, oh, guess what? Today, at 5 o'clock, art became self-referential. That's something we talk about looking way back, but it was happening at the time. So Keefe took her experience of nature in South Carolina that she was not getting in Manhattan, all right, walking through piney woods, that was off the table, all right, and walking along the Congaree, not the same in New York. And she stayed for hours. It was uh, famous, she was famous for her shoes, mm -hmm. right? Yes, she, she was. She auctioned her shoes, sold her shoes through the... Well, Tell the, that story quickly. The legend, legend has it that she, when she left Columbia College, she tucked her shoes underneath a bureau. But before she left in the 1916 yearbook, there's a want ad, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a satirical page of want ads. And she placed her, her shoes up for sale in, in the yearbook. And it says in there, you know, uh, seven and a half foot size, th three inch thick, you know, no sole, full no, full tip no shoes, you know. Five years guaranteed or your money back. 98 cents. This uh -huh. so because she, she was, walked all the time. She walked all the time. And she took students with her. and They had a hard time keeping up. And she would come back to her teeny little room, right, that the college uh, provided. And um, Jackie didn't say, did you, what you guys paid her, Keith? Because oh, I think they'd like to hear it. You know, I want to say it was like $40 a week. I came across a figure. $4 a week. Forty or four, four or forty. One, four dollars. That's okay. That's <laughs> you can tell somebody works for the college. That's I okay. It, could, yeah. <laughs> it can't be four dollars. It's four dollars yeah. a week. Yeah. Unbelievable. So she comes back to her Spartan room, and instead of drawing nature as it appeared, every leaf, she fig she was figuring out ways to draw nature as it felt which is something that I've been telling you know, different tour groups and audiences. That was a tough concept 100 years ago, and I think it still remains tough today. The gold standard today still, in some wacky way, is how photographically you can paint. Instead of just saying, okay, I'll take a picture of it, you'll look at me replicate this photo, that's not genius, that's tedious. And what Georgia was getting at was, how can I express how this feels? And she understood things of, that she had read in Kandinsky, Spiritual and Art. She had understood things from camera works. But it still didn't answer the question of how is this going to look. She had to come up with that. And so in the black and white drawing she does, she experiments with basic shapes. She gets rid of color. It's just black and white. And what fascinates, another fascinating thing, because there's a lot of fascinating things, is she decides not to work at an easel or draw at a table. She's going to sit on the floor and do this. She didn't even want to work the way she had been working before. Where did that come from? I, I think from her. I think a lot, some of this is O'Keefe, and some of it is the influences she had. Some of it is being in Columbia. But some critical pieces must have just come from her. And one of them was, I'm not even going to draw the way you know, the guys do. I'm going to sit on the floor. And she starts taking... A, experiences of the Congaree and translating those just into wavy lines and reflections in the water become just basic moons and she develops this vocabulary of shapes that are based on nature but don't fully describe nature and that is not the point the point is this is what I took from my time there and this vocabulary of basic shapes of curves single lines inverted V shapes that were once roots and now are going to be something else, right after she leaves Columbia and returns to color, those shapes go straight into her paintings with color layered on them. And the only way to understand those paintings is to understand what she did in, here in Columbia. So the, the real kicker to this whole story 
is that Columbia, if you go to the O'Keeffe Museum today, you do not see the word Columbia on the walls. Or if you go to the Met or wherever, Columbia what? You know, it's nowhere. Now, in fairness, it has been, the story of Columbia has been introduced in recent biographies, recent ones that have come out in the last few years. But the full story isn't there. And I, you know, I think Jackie and Columbia College, certainly um, uh, President Dindor needs to be mentioned. Their efforts in bringing this story forward, and I do not think this is an overstatement to say, are going to change the way that scholars look at Georgia O'Keeffe and eventually the way shows on Georgia O'Keeffe are done, and the way we understand her very first abstractions. Instead of the sort of hyper-sexualized criticism that has characterized O'Keeffe studies for years, I think we're gonna see more nature-based uh, interpretations of her work and connecting that more with Asian philosophy and Arthur Wesley Dow, whom she was a big fan of. But the way to make that all make sense is to look at this critical six-month period it, wherein she just divorces herself from her recent past, except for what she knew of art history, starts over again, embraces nature and modernism in equal measure, and becomes Georgia O'Keeffe here, not later. That is a huge story because Georgia O'Keeffe eventually not only paves the way for women artists who come after her, she is one of the first modern painters, period, in the world, and especially in the United States. And had it not been for this time here, we wouldn't have that. And so <coughs> I can't say enough about that. When you go into the show, you're going to see four drawings in the first gallery, very much in the vein of what I just described. And then in the second room, you're going to see a number of paintings done right on the heels of this time here. And hopefully that experience of abstracting nature, pushing it into paintings, will make sense. And so. Is it back to you, or is it the audience? Well, you know, I, I had some thoughts as you were talking, and, and, you know, I think the centennial for us started out as a pure celebration. You know, at Columbia College, it was obvious. We were going to celebrate this. This was obvious to us. But it's really turned into something much more than that. It's now become a crusade because <laughs> that is true. we are looking at legacy. And, and like Will pointed out, you'll, you'll see in some of the earlier books that Columbia gets very light mention. And it's interesting to see how people sort of paint our city at a certain point in time. This is an opportunity and a chance for Columbia to own this story in a way that contributes to Georgia O'Keeffe's legacy in a, in a much more positive way than it's been written about. And when my husband and I were in Santa Fe this summer working with the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum and the chief curators there, they brought up the fact that, you know, back in the 80s, 90s, there was a select group of scholars that really sort of held control over Georgia O'Keeffe's life. It was a mafia. Yeah. <laughs> it was. And I think that, you know, they controlled a lot of what was being put out there. And Cody Hartley, who's now the, the director of curatorial, curatorial affairs there, they're seeing a new wave of scholars and academics and they're, they're diving back into O'Keeffe's life in a very new and refreshing way. And this is an opportunity for us to forge a friendship with the O'Keeffe Foundation and the O'Keeffe people to make sure that that legacy is fitting seamlessly into the other parts of her life. And I will say that when we were out in Santa Fe, you know, it, to go out there and meet the O'Keeffe folks, it was a little intimidating for us because we thought, oh gosh, what are they going to think of us? You know, we're just, after everything we've read and how they painted our picture, are they going to think we're completely backwater? Are they going to have the same idea? So we had all these thoughts in mind. And, you know, I, I sort of liken it to being separated from a sibling at birth. And when we came back together again, we sort of instantly found this common ground that we bonded over because we shared this, we shared this parent in this story. And they were just as curious about us and our environment and our culture as we were about them. And it was really a wonderful experience to kind of share and exchange. And it just felt like you were meeting family because they knew how significant this story was. They understand that. They understand what it means to create this kind of legacy. Um, it's just getting it spread beyond us. So it's really a wonderful it's a wonderful bond that we share over this artist's 
nationally that is pretty spectacular. So I'm excited that Cody Hartley is coming in November to speak about that. He is the chief curator at the OP Museum, that should be pointed out. And uh, just to kind of following up on, on being intimidated by meeting the O'Keefe people, a lot of times if you, and some of you have experienced this I'm sure, if you have a PhD after your name or you're called Dr. So-and-so, there's a tendency for some people to just believe what you say. And I've experienced this a lot and I could just make something up and they're like, wow, Dr. Sal just said that. And I'm just like, yeah, that's right. And when I was, when I was in New York, uh, getting my PhD at uh, the Graduate Center, City University, um, many years ago. I had, I was meeting all kinds of new people and a lot of them had gone to, um, they'd gotten their masters at Yale and Harvard and Brown and I missed all over the place. And, um, but when I was out around the town, you know, talking to people, meeting people, and they would begin eventually getting around to saying, where are you from? I would say, from Salt Lake City, Utah. And they say, Utah, don't tell me. That's in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> and the point being, <laughs> art historians, number one, are not infallible and don't know everything. And sometimes, oftentimes, I want to say, the view of the rest of the country would be New York-centric. In other words, you know, it'd be from this, this citadel in Manhattan looking out at the rest of the country and writing these histories when in fact nobody writing about George O'Keefe had ever been here and didn't know anything about here. And um, I did a lot of books on California and um, I would talk to my colleagues about California. They were surprised that there were any artists out there at all. And I said, oh no, there are buildings and people. It's awesome. And they said, well, you, we, we know about Disneyland. I'm making this stuff up. I'm exaggerating, but I'm not making it up. And what happened with O'Keefe study is that it was controlled by a few people, and Columbia's just wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't on high on the list of anybody's interest. A because there wasn't anything they really knew about it. They couldn't speak to it with any authority, so better not to bring it up. And it was really an opportunity for somebody to jump in there and write some books or write a new chapter, and it just had not been done. And ditto with California art history, Utah art history. Now there are all kinds of books. There weren't 25 years ago. There are now. So this is a new thing. And it's important for people to realize that because O'Keefe is famous, that doesn't mean we know everything about her. There's some room left to learn. And one of the things, is, uh, and I want you to talk about this. <laughs> um, one of the things about O'Keefe coming down here and being completely on her own, and having the friend that she had, Anita Pollitzer, who was a suffragette of the first order, okay, that needs to be on the table. She was all about women's rights, and she would become, after 1915, more important in that struggle, was that these women were facing a glass ceiling that was this high. You know, there was nothing you could do. It's higher now, and one of the questions I keep getting is, you know, well, Thankfully, we don't have those issues anymore. What? <laughs> Hillary Clinton is the only candidate I'm aware of ever in my short life <laughs> where people keep talking about what she wears. Am I wrong about that? No one seems to much care what McCain wore. It wasn't very interesting, for one, but no one cares. It's an issue. Why? Because she's a woman. And I think we can say that, right? We're all adults here. It's still a sexism that pervades our society that had not gone away. So that story isn't over. And the, the role of women in the arts is not over. And the importance of education in the arts is an issue that isn't over. I think it's important to put it out there that Columbia College saw the importance of arts and education 100 years ago, and that they still do. But not everybody does, can we say that? I keep being told, don't say that out loud. <laughs> These are issues that are ongoing, and when you, when you talk about George O'Keefe, you talk about every single one of those issues. Mm -hmm. Have we achieved parity uh, for women in the arts? No. Does everybody believe arts and education is important? No. I mean, these things continue to be problematic. So um, anyway, I'll, if you have something to add about the women in the arts, 
Did I? I didn't cover it, did I? Well, no, no, no. I, no, I, th there is plenty of room to explore. You know, and Anita Pollitzer is just, I mean, we don't, we don't, we haven't elaborated too much on her, but she's fascinating in this story. You know, women didn't get the right to vote until 1920. These two were writing very intense letters to each other in 1915. Anita Pollitzer was instrumental in passing the 19th Amendment that allowed women to vote. And it happened shortly a few years after her and Georgia O'Keeffe began writing those letters to each other. You see in those letters the seeds and the passion that is then going to grow into these women who are going to become pretty dynamic leaders in the world. And without all the influence right on top of them while that while they while O'Keefe was here, you know, they're able to sort of have these really passionate exchanges. So it's really it's it and talking about the relevance of everything. It's a hundred year old story that's as fresh as today as it was a hundred years exactly ago. So. Absolutely. Our students are connecting with this story in a way that is bringing them to tears, literally. They feel themselves, they see themselves in Georgia O'Keeffe's story. And they're taking something from that, and that's pretty profound. I had a young woman last night at the opening who approached me, a Columbia College student, and she, her eyes started to tear up, and she said, this just got real. This just got real. And I said, yeah, yeah, if you let it really sink in for a minute, you'll see, you'll, you'll see yourself in the story in a do lot of think, ways. Do you think the story is as important as the art? I'm sorry, oh, I, yes. could, I just thought of this question and I, <laughs> I couldn't Yes, keep it. Uh, even more Did so. Did you guys hear my question? Yeah. Do you yeah. think the, her story is, is as important as the art she made? In some ways, even more so, I think. I think so, too. I mean, the, the barriers uh, against women in the arts in 1915 were so formidable that into the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, many women artists, I'll give you examples, continued to sign their names with only their initial so that potential buyers would not know they were a woman. Decades after O'Keeffe was already breaking down a lot of barriers, it was still impossible to sell if a buyer knew you were a woman. Why? It couldn't possibly be an investment. That was the message. O'Keefe re rejected all of that. Anita rejected all of that kind of nonsense, and they, you know, they went forward uh, with their own uh, strong feelings about parity. And I love what you just had to say, that the story is as fresh now. I wish it weren't, but it is. And every once in a while, you do an exhibition that has political ramifications, and Again, one of the things that is so difficult, uh, continues to be so difficult, is standing in, you know, up and talking about issues that are touchy. But um, this story, it's unavoidable. Uh, I'll, right. I'll mention one other um, offshoot topic and uh, the, the story has, has also given birth to the immigration issue in the United States. Uh, I worked with a contemporary Latino artist two years ago and was learning his story a little bit. He uh, came from Colombia, South America, and he was a gay man, and he, found, he lived all over the world, and he found himself in Columbia, South Carolina with his partner, who was from here. And he immediately, just like Georgia O'Keeffe, had the very same reaction. What am I gonna do here? I'm gonna stagnate, this is deliciously stupid. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I mean, he just, <laughs> His, uh, his own self-identity just got turned inside out. And um, you know he went through a process of really, and he was an artist, and he went through a process of trying to figure out how am I going to make it here? And he, saw, he said to me, he said, you know, I came across Georgia O'Keeffe's letters when she was here, and I read them, and she was my muse. She was my muse, and she was my savior. And I put, I put one of her quotes on my studio wall, and I lived with that quote, hibernating in Columbia's something I would not recommend anyone to miss. <laughs> and he said, you know, that speaks to me, and he put it on his studio wall, and he lived with that quote for a year, and it got him through a full body of work. And it was, in the first, in that series that he created, the first piece that he did was of Georgia O'Keeffe. He paid, he paid tribute to her, and he honored her as his muse. And it got him through a very tough time acclimating himself 
and his lifestyle very parallel to Georgia O'Keeffe's lifestyle in 1915. It was an incredible story. Um, so the, yeah, yeah, her story is even more relevant sometimes. Can you than just work. can you mention briefly your husband's film? Yes. This so, would be a good place to talk about that. So have any of you at the ETV, South Carolina ETV is a third partner in this wonderful partnership that we're doing over at Georgia O'Keeffe, and they created uh, a 30 minute documentary on Georgia O'Keeffe's time here, and uh, also some of her time in New Mexico, and it's called A Woman on Paper. Has anyone seen it yet? It's been, it's, um, it's, it's being broadcast on, on ETV, and it just recently got picked up by American Public Television, which means American Public Television is going to make it, uh, is going to offer it to all national markets across the country. If I'd have known that, I would have got a haircut before I was in this film. <laughs> I had done something. I thought I was just going to be here, you know. You'll see interviews on there from uh, Will and myself, Steve Nevitt from Columbia College, along with Cody Hartley and a few other scholars from New Mexico that really weave in this, uh, this beautiful um, uh, circular story of her time here the arc of her life and how it comes full circle at the end of her life. Because there is a beautiful sort of wrap up at the end. Is that available online? The full documentary is not available online yet, but it will be sooner or later. But you can find the broadcast times on ETV or you can go to ideasofmyown.com and that's the Centennial website and we have all the broadcast times listed. We're also screening it here at the museum twice a week, um, Thursdays at 2 and Sundays at 3. Did you all hear that? No. <laughs> We're also screening the film here at the museum twice a week. So it's Thursdays at 2 and then Sundays at 3. Uh, how did Oki learn about the Columbia College job and how did she go about applying for it? Do you want to take that or I can take it? Well, you know, I, I can honestly say we, we don't know. We have no idea. I'm yet. pretty sure she. We don't know for sure, but when she was in New York, jobs were posted or talked about at the Art Students League and at Teachers College, because there were a lot of people looking for jobs, and universities across the country would send things to Teachers College and to the Art you know, various institutions in New York, who literally, you know, would post them, and I think that's where she found out about it. It's a pretty good guess. And her application was via the mail, we know that. She didn't come down. She wrote and applied. We did have uh, one, of our, uh, one of our arts administrators on campus travel to Columbia University over the summer and, and Teachers College. And she did try to get into their archives and apparently they're going under some renovation and they're sort of on lockdown right now. So she had to get additional special provisions to get in there. So she couldn't get access to the records that she really wanted to see at Teachers mm -hmm. College at that time period. But she did see some of the, um, I think some of the course records that O'Keefe was um, signed up for when she was there. Not a great answer, but it's, yeah. we did our best. We're trying. <laughs> Why was your time here six months as opposed to a longer period? We, we know the answer to that. You want Go to ahead. take it? I'll let you. Yeah. Well, she got another offer. And what happened was, I mean, she was here. She did not have her credential when she got hired. Right? It was one of the reasons they could pay her $4 a week. And so a, a college in Texas said, if you come and teach here, we will pay for you your summer school at Columbia Teachers College in New York so you can finish up your degree. And that was a heck of an offer, right? We will pay for it. So she could not turn that down. And, and she was really wanting to go back out west again. She had taught in right. the Amarillo public schools um, beforehand, and she knew Texas. Oh, she loved and she loved it. Right. She loved it. She was dying to get back out there. So it was a terrific. She just got a better offer, which happens all the yeah. time to us here at the museum. <laughs> <laughs> it just does, you know. I mean, somebody gives you an offer. It's like, well, hey, can you match this? No, so bye. <laughs> and, but, and, and just for a timeline and everything. She, she left, um, she made the decision to leave around February 25th. We have a letter that says, 
you know, I've made the decision to leave, kick up your heels, I'm going to Texas, that's what she says. Mm -hmm. And so by February 28th, she was either on a train or a boat heading back up to New York. Right, and in the show there's a little watercolor of a, of a cabin building out in the field, mm -hmm. that's Texas. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I wanted to show some things right on the heels of her Columbia experience. And when you look at that little watercolor of Texas, it's as simple as it can be. No detail. Everything's flat and just summery, cryptic even. And it flows from this modernist explosion she had here in Columbia. So I'm, thanks for the question. That's a Texas piece. And then you said January 1st was a... Yeah, a significant date. So January 1st is another... And I, know, I realize we didn't really talk through the entire timeline, but... January the 1st is another significant point in time because that is the day, 1916, 1916 that uh, Anita Pollitzer receives a batch of drawings from Columbia. And it's, it's the day that, that Anita Pollitzer takes those drawings to Alfred Stieglitz at his gallery, 291, to show him the drawings. This is the very first time that Alfred Stieglitz sees Georgia O'Keeffe's works and sees these drawings and has a very profound response to them. He's quoted as saying they're, they're the most purest, most sincere works he's ever seen come in a gallery. And it's the first time he, he really wants to know who this artist is. He asks Anita, are you writing this young woman? Who is she? And he says, you know, I think I might show these works. And um, you know, George O'Keefe did ask Anita Pollitzer, please don't show these, you know, don't show, you can get some, you know, maybe get some critiques from, from instructors, but don't show these to anyone. They were extremely personal. But Anita, Anita Pollitzer was very moved by the works. She wrote George O'Keefe several times and said, I feel you, you, in this charcoal and in this paper. I can't tell you how much I really feel you. And, and she tells Georgia, you have made art, even if you don't know the definition of it, because they were deliberating. What is art? What is art? And Anita Pollitzer just said, you may not realize it, but you've done it. So I think Anita Pollitzer was just too tempted. And Georgia O'Keeffe does say that she, she wants some validation from Alfred Stieglitz. I mean, ultimately, of, of anyone, she wants to hear Alfred Stieglitz say how much he loves her work, and he does. So it's a pretty profound moment. I think it's significant that, you know, she has this best friend, Anita Pollitzer, and you say, please don't do this. And of course, what do they do? They betray you, right? I mean, <laughs> that's what best friends do. That's like their role. And um, so that ha that's part of the story. But if she hadn't betrayed her, then she wouldn't have met Stieglitz. And if Stieglitz hadn't have divorced his wife, then O'Keefe wouldn't have had this lifelong serious partner in art and husband and promoter. And it all begins with this batch of drawings in Columbia, because that's what sets it all in motion. The letters, the discussions, then the show at 291, and then they meet, they fight, they fall in love. He takes these spectacular photographs of her. The critics say, oh, it's all about sex. We're still getting over that. Um, that's a story that's not over. And um, the way to get at that is to, start, is to start here, where it really starts to get serious. Before here, she's paint, in her own words, she's painting like everybody else. After here, not. And so this is really critical. And uh, any more questions about, yeah? Do we know much about the art that she produced while she was here? And then do we have any in Columbia? Okay, the, the question is, do we have any art in Columbia? And do we know, because we have some of the work she produced in Columbia on view in the show, okay, in the first gallery. There are, there are two volumes, catalog resume of the works of George O'Keefe, documenting every single known work that she did in her entire career. And the Columbia drawings, I want to say, amount to about surviving 30 or 40, is that about right? It's not just four, it's a lot. And um, we have four because that's what we could get. I mean, in terms of the exhibition. There are O'Keeffe exhibitions right now in Australia, you know, in Sydney, Paris, Chicago, and Colombia. <laughs> so 
It sounds like a t-shirt, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's the reality. Um, we had a hard time getting those. But uh, the bulk of the Columbia drawings, I think this is the answer to your question, are in the National Gallery in Washington. And they were gifts. And O'Keefe was very careful to gift uh, her, co her collection to important institutions. And they're fragile. And so they just don't travel them unless there's a really good reason. And we said our really good reason is this 100 year anniversary is going to happen one time. And it's the only place it can happen is here. And then I cried. And then they, <laughs> and then they gave us two. So they gave us two, and the O'Keefe Museum gave us one. And Greenville County gave us the only O'Keefe that's in South Carolina is at the Greenville County Museum of Art. And it's one of the four drawings in the first gallery. So um, this crusade that Jackie was talking about, part of that crusade is to get, eventually, a Georgia O'Keeffe painting uh, here at the Columbia Museum of Art so that we can tell this story forever and have Columbia College's role in this up on the wall, you know, in small print. Um, <laughs> Columbia Museum, Columbia College, bring you this Georgia O'Keeffe. So we need to have that in order, because there is not an O'Keeffe painting in South Carolina. There is one drawing, and it's in the, uh, it's in the gallery. And I'm, I'm not sure if, if some of you are aware of the story. It made headlines last fall. Um, we got news that uh, Sotheby's had a big auction, and they, they sold to Georgia O'Keeffe, one of her very iconic paintings, Jimson Weed, White Flower Number 1. Well, it's so it sold for a record forty-four point four million dollars. So, if and some of you have that laying around, <laughs> you know, just let us know. So that makes our challenge a little bit more challenging. But she, uh, you know, she's now the record holder for the highest amount paid of any female artist to date. And you can see some of those lines and shapes and forms. You can you can trace them right back to the lines and the shapes and the forms and the language that she developed here. We won't let that price tag uh, stop us. Uh, the thing is, we just won't pay it. You know, we won't pay, obviously, $44 million, but we will, we will find an O'Keefe and we'll get somebody to give it to us. We'll do that. We'll do it, we'll do it before I die. <laughs> That's a promise. Are the letters published? Yes. Oh yeah, there, there are several different publications. Did everyone hear the question, are the letters published? They're uh, out of print right now uh, is the complete correspondence of George O'Keefe and Anita Pollitzer, but you can find it on Amazon or eBay, and that's one book. And now there are two volumes of her correspondence with uh, Stieglitz, and that's called My Far Away One. And because that's what they would call each other, you know, in their letters, my far away one. And sometimes they call each other other things, and it's in the letters. And uh, they're so wonderful in talking about what's going on in New York and what you know, what they mean to each other, what art means, and you know what you know what Picasso means or Matisse or whatever. Long people used to we know this, right? People used to write, and the letter used to be something that you would take time to think about and save. And, you know, we don't do that anymore. And, I mean, you know, it just ask Hillary, where, where are those emails? I don't know. I lost them. I mean, we don't put the same kind of time and care into that, that a um, hundred years ago was such a common thing. And these letters are beautifully written. So, yeah, you can get access to all of them. She waited in her will. She mandated, how many years was it? That 50 years after he died. Before yes. they could go public, because she wanted him long dead yeah. before they came out. And um, when you read them, you know it's it's very personal stuff. The original letters are are housed at the Bein the Yale Beinecke Rare Manuscript and Book Collection. So for a while there, you you know you had to have special status and whatnot to see those. But I think they're pretty. I think they're online digitally now, um, and I think you can go and do research and see the original letters at the Beinecke. The nice thing about the book is it's, I love footnotes. 
if there's a, a, a mention of a name in there that's obscure or a, an exhibition or something, the footnote just tells you, cleans it up for you, tells you what they're talking about. And there, those letters are edited by a, a colleague of mine, Sarah Crino, just did a fabulous job editing those letters. And uh, Georgia O'Keeffe herself identified Sarah, didn't she, to do that project? Yes. Well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she liked to control things. Okay, we have been at one hour. Is there, are there any more uh, questions? And we take a couple more and if, okay. I found that visiting Ghost Ranch changed the way I saw O'Keeffe's painting. Where can I go in Columbia? To she, what? To see, to, to see something that she saw. I'm gonna let you answer that because Old Main yeah. is gone. Old Main's gone, the building is gone, um, but she was, that she lived that she in. was in. You, the campus is one place that you can come to, but the campus, of course, is very different than what it was 100 years ago. We do have some very big trees <laughs> that, were, that are still there that she was probably um, walking around at the time. But I would say the Congaree, the river, outdoors, nature. Um, I would definitely say the woods, the piney woods, trails. I mean, she writes very vividly about taking her students out um, and having them stop and listen to the wind blowing through the trees. So, I, I mean, it's really fascinating because you don't have to go very far to experience the same exact things that she, she certainly has heightened my sense. Mm -hmm. of, of, where, of where we are. Of where we are and what's around us. <coughs> yeah. What is the earliest work that exists of it's hers? If, if, if no, was it in Wisconsin? She had, there is a very early, the question is what is the earliest known work of, by George O'Keefe? In, in art history we call that juvenilia. We could just call it early work, but we're pretentious. And so we call it ju <laughs> juvenilia. And among her juvenilia is, are some family portraits. They're actually pretty beautifully drawn. And I think that what it tells me is that she was serious about being an artist from a very young age. This was not something that popped up in her late 20s or even early 20s. As a, as a young girl, she was working and she had facility and she had some skill. And then as a teenager and at 20 and just after, and she's in Chicago, she's copying Aubrey Beardsley drawings and doing black and white Art Nouveau sketches. So she's looking at who's who in the world, you know, and she actually does some magazine illustration. They look just like Beardsley prints. And they're fantastic, and they get published. So that early work tells us that she was serious um, at a very young age and had technical skill that was going to be developed further. A lot of, I mean, just to kind of expand on this answer, it still remains a myth in the minds of a lot of people that abstract artists can't draw. Like, if they could draw, they would. You know, like, why wouldn't you draw? You must not be able to. It's like, I can do what you do. I just don't want to. And it, it's just a hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. Picasso could draw photographically if he wanted to, and so could O'Keeffe. And she demonstrates that skill not only in uh, those early drawings and portraits. There's a painting at the Art Students League when she was a student there of a dead bunny. And every time I bring up the dead bunny, my wife's eyes tear up. I love it. And um, it looks just like a dead bunny very photographic and then there's the brass pot next to it. They leave it on the wall because they show it as an example of student work. Come to the Art Students League, you'll be famous too. <laughs> Not true. But um, yeah, very, very early work in that catalog, a catalog resume. And if you're serious about wanting to look at it, um, Thomas More Library at USC has it. You can check it out, the catalog resume. They're heavy. Didn't she do some statues? Very few. We have one in the show from 1916. So thank you for the question. The University of Iowa. Probably so, because she did them in editions. And um, the O'Keeffe Museum loaned us the one she did in 1916, and we wanted that because that too is right on the heels of her time in Columbia. And it's a very abstract shape born out of the drawings that she did here. So thanks for that question. You'll see that in the show. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for coming today in such you know, like an impressive number and for braving what I'm sure has been a difficult week, two weeks for a lot of you, and making your way here. And I want to thank Jackie 
our special guests for coming today, and Glenna for introducing us, and I want to not thank our tech people for messing us up. <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy the show. <laughs>